Melbourne today was hit by the worst dust storm on record. Sydney Harbour, dominated by its spectacular opera house, a familiar symbol of today's Australia, an immense, thriving nation at the bottom of our planet. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and this week in the final program of our series, we look at the impact of modern man on the finely tuned natural systems of this great island continent. In 1788, Governor Arthur Phillips stepped ashore right here in Sydney Harbour with a motley assortment of convicts and sailors to establish Australia's first permanent European settlement. But the white man and his animals had a profound impact, mostly for the worse, on native Australia. Species after species declined and ultimately vanished with the arrival of the settlers, their livestock, and their pets. The story of the human impact on the vast Australian countryside mirrors what has happened elsewhere in the world and shows that nature can hit back when we have no regard for the land and the conditions that sustain life. Once flying foxes performed their shadow play against a low moon or a setting sun. Today, the night lights of Sydney provide the backdrop. Cities, lights, bridges. In only 200 years, the face of much of Australia has changed. Native plants and animals evolved in the remote solitude of an island continent. When that solitude was shattered, some were resilient enough to adapt, like the possum rummaging through a park that replaced native bush. But many creatures retreated or vanished altogether. Change was great and swift, driven by need, ignorance, and greed. But a great deal has been learned, and there's still time to preserve much of that unique native Australia. The first European settlers huddled on the shores, afraid of the forbidding interior looming behind them. Most Australians still live on the coast. 80% crowd into cities sprawling by the sea. They are the most urbanized people on earth. There are only 16 million of them, living off a land the size of the United States. But the ancient leached soils are much less fertile than ours and their society rests on a fragile base. 
In the manner of all new settlers, they surrounded themselves with familiar things. Terraced housing, side by side, as if to deny all that frightening space. Mansions with manicured lawns, complete with imported roses and bees. A semblance of home in England. The effects often seemed pleasing, but transplanting practices learned in the old world also produced disaster. Melbourne today was hit by the worst dust storm on record. The city was browned out by a wave of thick dust 150 kilometres long and three kilometres high in places. Rail and road traffic was thrown into chaos and the city's three airports closed as the dust swirled in choking clouds. The Conservation Council of Victoria said similar storms were occurring each week in the state's Mallee country and had removed tons of topsoil. The council said much of the land denuded of soil this summer won't recover completely in this generation, if ever. The true nature of the land can't be ignored, even in the cities. The interior continues to send choking reminders of the toll exacted by overclearing and overworking thin, poor soils. As cities spread out into the bush, they face the ever-present threat of fire. Southeast Australia is the most populated corner of the continent. It's also the most fire-prone area in the world. Its eucalypt woodlands have evolved with both fire and drought. At the moment, I'm watching my house burn down. I'm sitting out on the road in front of my own house where I've lived for 13 or 14 years. And it's going down in front of me. The roof is falling and it's in flames and there's nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing. But fire in Australia is not only personal tragedy. It's also necessary for the bush to survive. This was part of a strange reality that took time to learn. Fire is not a freak calamity, but a natural force, especially in Australia's wooded margins. The first settlements on the eastern fringe were hemmed in by walls of flammable bush, forests and woodlands very different from those of Europe. Eucalypts dominated. They're crowned by wispy, dry foliage loaded with volatile oils and have the odd habit of shedding bark as well as leaves around the seasons. Seasons that seemed vague and ill-defined to Europeans accustomed to real springs and winters. Strange creatures lived in the bush, most of them deemed unfit to eat. But it didn't take long to discover the value of their fur, feathers, and plumes. In 1840, the painter naturalist John Gould was among the few who appreciated the unique beauty of Australia's animals and warned of the dangers they faced. Most early settlers viewed Australia as a second-class world, which could be exploited but need not be cherished. They hoped to make their fortunes and go home. The physical conquest was soon accomplished, but the emotional discovery of this place as home was a long time coming. Australia's forests became the first portion of her natural wealth to be plundered, and the richest habitats were the first to fall. To the first settlers, the forest seemed limitless an inexhaustible source of timber. The misconception was understandable. Very little was known about the continent, how large it was, whether it was one island or more, or what, if anything, lay beyond the bush. In fact, only a tenth of Australia was covered by forests when Europeans came to settle. 
forest which included the tallest hardwoods in the world. After nearly 200 years of ever more efficient technology, and despite early laws to save trees, less than half of that original cover remains. The inroads into what's left continue. Attitudes seem to change little in two centuries. These are typical of the forests on which all Australia depends for its supplies of wood for every purpose. The sap that runs through our trees may be termed the lifeblood of the country. A vast treasure house of raw materials has been built up through the ages by the patient processes of nature. Plenty of it in the Quanda rainforest of North Queensland, some 30 miles west of Cairns. The forest is estimated to hold some 25 million super feet of the world's best timber for veneer. Many trees from this area are up to 500 years old. And as new roads are cut deeper into the forest, rare and valuable timbers are being discovered. But attitudes are changing at last. We now know that the forest, and rainforest in particular, is not limitless, nor is it renewable. Protests did not stop the construction of this road, but they have forced at least a few remnants of rainforest onto a list for World Heritage Protection. There's precious little rainforest left in Australia to protect. A mere five million acres remain, a quarter of what stood here before the first axe blow fell. In addition to being harvested for timber, vast tracks were flattened to make way for farms. Trees were seen as enemies. They fell to the advance of the animal, which became the source of Australia's prosperity. Sheep brought profit to the nation, but also ruin to much of the land. The fragile soils and plants had never felt the impact of a hard hoof. Only the fall of kangaroo's soft feet. Now, 135 million sheep graze the sweeping plains, enough to make Australia the world's largest producer of wool. In the higher rainfall areas near the coast, woodlands have given way to rolling pastures. There's a new balance, and it's more or less stable, but the drier inland cannot recover as quickly. To reach the dry interior, settlers had to cross the Great Divide, the mountains that run the length of Australia's east coast. They stood as the sole obstacle to expansion for the first 30 years of settlement. They still trap most of the moisture before the winds can carry it to the immense interior. But a little rain does manage to reach the west in the few streams which drain down that side of the divide. They combine to become Australia's only large river system, the Murray Darling. The Murray River meanders through very flat country and its flow varies enormously, making it vulnerable to human interference. The banks overflow every spring when the snow melts, and the river floods into aimless streams called billabongs. 
This is the domain of the majestic river red gums. For much of the time, they stand in dry ground, but they rely on floods to replenish moisture and nutrients and to germinate their seeds. Each adult tree is flanked by a legion of healthy saplings. Paddle steamers fueled by red gums plied the river, bringing supplies in and carrying wool out. The Murray was dammed and locks were built to improve it as a means of transport and to supply water to the rain-starved areas through which it flowed. Disrupting the river spelled doom for many plants and animals whose lives were locked into its rhythm of flood and drought. Natural overflow lakes were dammed to make permanent reservoirs, and the giant red gums drowned. The need for water produced great schemes, but also great problems. The old Eildon Dam could not cope with the excessive supply of water during times of flood. Thus, periodically, millions of gallons were wasted as they roared over the spillway. Water went for irrigation of the rich Golden Valley. But with the growing demands for more food, both for home consumption and export, the need for greater production in the valley became urgent. Now, from the Great Lake, building up behind the dam wall, the first waters go rushing into the base of the intake tower to go on its way for irrigation. For a century and a half, the pattern of Australian rural settlement was dominated by political dreams of a sturdy farming people, a vision of life on the land as morally superior to life in the cities. Many urban poor yearned for a modest independence on a few acres. Nearly 50,000 soldiers were settled on the land after the two world wars. Some succeeded, but most suffered great privations and eventual failure at enormous cost to their morale, to public funds, and to the land itself. Some of these acres are already showing the shape of things to come. Before long, the fighting man will be rendering another service to his country as his newly developed land springs into life. Irrigation has helped the Murray-Darling Basin produce half the nation's food and wool, but it has also produced something that was not foreseen a creeping blight that's ruining much of the land. Concentrations of rising salt. The tons of water pumped onto the plains have raised the underground water table, flushing the mineral salts to the surface. There they accumulate as the water evaporates. More and more productive land is turning into salty desert. There's no practical solution in sight. The hunger for land drove settlers to open up the most marginal of areas, such as this in Western Australia. They stripped off the native vegetation whose root systems had prevented the underground water from rising. The water rose and brought salts to the surface. Glistening ulcers erupted through the golden grain. Often, the first settlers were encouraged by unusual runs of good season, and a great swath of inland Australia was turned over to the plough. Wheat sought to rival wool as a source of wealth. New strains were bred to flourish in meager soil and marginal rainfall. But drought ended many dreams. Even in the more reliable areas, the golden harvests always had a price. Salt, erosion and in some years, plagues of biblical proportions. 
The common mouse probably arrived with the first ships. Freed of nature's checks and balances, they ran amuck in this new land. In plague years, farm dogs soon lose their taste for them, and wheat towns measure their catches in tons. One town destroyed more than 500 tons in one season, about 30 million mice. With natural ways disrupted by the spread of agriculture, native animals also erupted into plagues. For countless centuries, locusts have swarmed in a belt sweeping down eastern Australia. With wheat and other grains planted in their path, they multiplied into ruinous pests. A locust eats its own body weight in a day. A swarm of millions devours tons. A single swarm may be so vast that it covers an area of many miles. And when it's on the move, it can sweep across 500 miles in a night. Man is beginning to win the locust wars now with new and efficient weapons. Helicopters to search. And spray planes to destroy. Locusts, mice, even plants became pests. Among the most dramatic was the prickly pear. Imported for hedges and making dyes, it ran wild across 25 million acres of Queensland and New South Wales. Impenetrable barriers six feet high walled in homesteads and rendered the land useless. Nothing could stop it until nature herself was conscripted. Her weapons were the tiny larvae of a humble cactus moth, recruited from Argentina, where the plant originated. Three billion eggs were distributed through the infested regions. Legions of voracious caterpillars bore their way through the plants, 12 million of them to every acre. Hollowing out the fleshy tissue kills the cactus. By 1925, the larvae had won the battle. The barriers were brought down the nightmare forest which had choked the land for 40 years vanished, the pastures returned. It proved an important breakthrough, controlling the imported menace with its natural enemies. The successful war on the prickly pear was Australia's first large-scale exercise in biological pest control. It was a valuable lesson, 
and nature's own weapons were then developed to rid Australia of other problems created by the invasion of new creatures. Some worked, some are still being tried out. Bushflies were a menace to man and beast. They had always been prolific, breeding in the dung of native animals, and the millions of imported cattle gave them vastly more extensive nurseries. Cattle drop dung a dozen times a day. Each pad can incubate 1,500 flies, and they multiply astronomically. Native beetles that bury and eat dung are natural enemies of the flies, but they won't move out onto the open range. To cope with this introduced dung, foreign beetles were imported. By feeding on the dung, the beetles rob the bushfly larvae of their sustenance, and far fewer survive to grow into adult flies. Even more importantly, the beetles break the cow pads into lumps and bury them as hatcheries for their own eggs. Pads vanish within hours and their nutrients return to fertilize the soil. On many fronts, large and small, scientists are perfecting ways to manage the land. When settlers first moved their herds and flocks inland, fencing off paddocks, they changed the pastures and upset the balance between native plants and animals. The changes favored the large kangaroos, but worked against many smaller species. Introduced stock were provided with artificial water holes, which also enabled kangaroos to multiply. And the sheep and cattle ate down the tall, dry grasses, stimulating fresh growth. So attractive to kangaroos, it's been called marsupial lawn. Numbers soared. Kangaroos became an economic threat. And by the 1870s, there were so many, the ranchers declared war. Today, about three million kangaroos are culled officially each year, perhaps as many again illegally. There's concern the quotas are too high, putting even abundant species like eastern greys at risk. But the harsh truth is that sheep and kangaroos compete for the land. Some argue that raising kangaroos instead of sheep would save the land. Kangaroos have no hooves to compact the soil and don't graze the tall grasses down to the nub. While large kangaroos have increased in number, small species like the betong have suffered. They rely on dense plant growth, and cattle and sheep are simply eating them out of food and shelter. Already, 17 species of small mammals have vanished since the Europeans arrived. 28 more are endangered. Ironically, one small marsupial has found its last refuge in the waste of the very society that displaced it. In a junkyard in western Victoria, a handful of eastern barred bandicoots clings to existence, the last survivors of their species on the continent. 
Some may question whether a few marsupials more or less matter, but the roll call of vanished and endangered animals signaled that the land which underpins man's welfare is being degraded. Wallabies, marsupial tigers, bandicoots, native rodents, all casualties of man's invasion. For the native wild dog, the dingo, itself an invader 5,000 years ago, there was plenty of prey and carrion. Ranchers came to loathe and detest it. Dingoes are still classed as vermin. It's been joined by immigrant hunters, domestic cats gone wild. Foxes brought in for fox hunting wreaked havoc among native birds and small mammals. Legions of imports ran wild. Feral pigs are very destructive and are carriers of disease. There are now believed to be 20 million of them. Feral goats are laying waste to vast stretches of fragile hill country. In the West, wild donkeys are a menace. In the center, there are more camels than in Arabia. Like donkeys, they were replaced by modern transport and turned loose. But it took the horrific impact of one creature to drive home just how high the price of meddling with nature can be. Public enemy number one, a foe whose battalions are thousands of millions strong despite unceasing slaughter. Today, as the rabbit menace reaches an all-time high, national leaders, farmers, graziers, and local authorities are fighting a vital battle. The prize is Australia's rich and fertile grazing land. Grasslands are laid bare as rabbits destroy vegetation which keeps the soil together and dig winding burrows to warrant below the surface. Millions of acres have been laid waste. It is a grim fact that the rabbit was originally imported to Australia from England to provide sport for gentlemen. Much of Australia was perfect for rabbits. Temperate climate, sandy soil for burrows, plenty of grass. They bred like rabbits. Nothing could stop them. Neither guns, nor traps, nor poison, nor fences. Some fences ran for 600 miles, but the rabbits got through before the last post was driven in. They drove Australia to the brink of economic ruin, and farmers resorted to ever more desperate measures. On one property alone, there were an estimated 36 million rabbits. A terrible virus, myxoma, was introduced and eventually came close to wiping them out. But now the survivors are resistant. Poison baits are used and are effective. But for every rabbit killed, thousands still thrive. The amazing fecundity of the rodent is traditional. With grasslands ravaged, erosion increasing, and crops being damaged, the problem is daily growing more serious. The rabbit war is one we must win, and win quickly. The country might have coped with sheep alone, but with a rabbit plague compounding the impact of overgrazing, the land was left with almost no chance to recover when the cycle inevitably turned to drought. A nation's life depends on its soil, and Australia's is at risk. Large sections of Australia are affected by drought. Even rabbits die of hunger and thirst. We cannot avoid occasional drought, but we can do much to control it by water conservation plus land conservation. Undeniably, that is the major post-war job for Australians. This was a farm. 
the miracle soil has gone with the wind and valuable wheatland has become a desert. The sand was beneath the topsoil and now freed it moves on to smother thousands and thousands more valuable acres. It's a grim picture and a grimmer warning. Valley root, all that remains of the hardy eucalypt that covered this area, binding the soil. We killed off the mallee trees indiscriminately and not content, dug up the roots for firewood. It's great firewood, but the wholesale removal of these mallee roots has helped to ruin the mallee country itself. The partial devastation of this paddock is the result of erosion when it had water. When rains come again, water erosion will be heavy because the land is unprotected by grass and surface vegetation. If erosion goes uncontrolled, then it's only a question of time. For thousands of rural families, time ran out. A succession of droughts finally broke their tenuous hold on the land. Even 40 years ago, the lesson was abundantly clear, and an urgent new word joined the vocabulary of political debate, conservation. Land devastation and erosion is largely due to ignorance and exploitation. Overdestruction of natural timbers and herbage, plus overstocking of the land, is the primary cause of soil erosion by wind and water. If we do not turn from exploitation to conservation, we shall, without question, destroy our national heritage. Americans rose up unitedly and fought its Dust Bowl problem. We Australians must do the same, because we have exactly the same problem. Millions and millions of sheep on the move powder the dry soil into dust. The rest is easy for a high wind. The sky is darkened with a pall of dust and sand to a dull, malevolent eye. The red pall flows over coastal cities. It irritates us. How dusty, we say. Don't call it dust. Call it earth. The good earth. That's somebody's farm up there in the sky. Part of our land. Part of Australia blowing away to be irrevocably lost in the Pacific Ocean. Forty years later, the farms still blow into the ocean. The cities still reap the harvest of dust. And the outback still exacts a ruinous price for misreckoning the odds and overstocking. Hindsight reveals the early mistakes clearly enough. Only time and experience could uncover the fickle, often brutal nature of Australia. Native creatures were adapted to the unpredictable rounds of good times and bad. Imported animals could only perish, especially when abandoned by their human masters. Drought intensifies the pressures of feral animals on the country. They compete with the native inhabitants for diminishing food and water. Unlike native animals, which can get by on very little, horses need regular drinks. Once water sinks out of reach, there's no hope. For predators and prey alike, as with all who try to survive in this country, there is no margin for error. Awful though this spectacle is, it portrays the stark and simple truth. Exceed the land's capacity to support life, and the surplus dies. But now, man has the means to avoid this kind of tragedy. Assessing how much this unpredictable country can sustain has always been a gamble. Now, the odds have improved dramatically. Satellites coupled to computers give an instant overview of any part of the continent 
and reveal patterns of drought, overgrazing, and erosion. Orbiting monitors pass over Australia in regular cycles. It took 500 years for Australia to be mapped completely. Now, it gets charted twice a day. Cloudless skies, small population, and a huge hinterland make this kind of surveillance an ideal means to track changing conditions. It's still a developing science, but remote sensing is already an important tool in the management of this huge continent, especially the fragile interior. The very heart of Australia is a pastoral island surrounded by desert. While conditions here don't suit sheep, cattle do fairly well but at the expense of the land. Wells were sunk to tap the underground water, and the dams became the focal points for the cattle's daily wanderings. The computer reveals what will happen. The concentrated traffic tramples the thin soils to dust. The satellite data predict ever-widening areas of erosion, a red alert to shift the cattle. The satellites monitor radiation from areas as small as 120 square yards. The images are enhanced and interpreted with increasingly sophisticated techniques. Even the smallest changes are detected and charted. The observations provide a detailed, continuous record from which to forecast trends. Instead of guesswork, land managers now have advance warning to tell them when to shift cattle or ship them out altogether. Of course, providing information is one thing. Making sure it's used is another. And the larger question of whether the interior should be grazed at all is still to be considered. In the meantime, remote sensing is being combined with Aboriginal knowledge to manage one of Australia's wild places, the Tanami Desert, 180 miles northwest of Alice Springs. It's a large, flat region of sand and spinifex braided with ancient riverbeds which still channel the infrequent rains. The drainage lines show up most clearly on the satellite sensors, together with other patterns, scars left by burning. Aborigines roamed here until 50 years ago, working their land as they'd always done, with fire. When they left for the white missions, their small-scale controlled burning stopped. Natural fires were less frequent, but also larger and more destructive. The vegetation changed, and many animals vanished. Now, scientists are reintroducing the aboriginal way with fire, and the Tanami is returning to how it was. Burning clears the ground and prepares a seedbed of ashes. Eventually, a rare rainfall wakens seeds that may have lain dormant for 25 years. Over time, this small-scale patchwork burning creates a mosaic of varied plant growth. The spinifex becomes interspersed with succulent plants, bearing nutritious seeds and berries. It's a combination that ideally suits certain marsupials, and the Tanami is the last refuge for animals that have disappeared from the rest of the continent. One is the rufous hare wallaby, called Mala by the Aborigines. 
There are fewer than 200 left. With satellite sensing to locate unburned spinifex for shelter, and selective burning to promote the right mix of fresh plant growth for food, malas may survive and increase. These tiny kangaroos are part of Australia's unique heritage, to much of which has been lost already. Another refugee in this sanctuary fashioned by fire is the bilby, the rabbit-eared bandicoot. Malas and bilbies also belong to this land. Should they vanish, another part of Australia vanishes with them. The novel marriage of modern science and traditional practices offers hope. Elsewhere, too, there is still opportunity for finding imaginative ways of matching needs and dreams to the nature of the continent. That's especially so here in the north. Compared to the rest of Australia, it's barely been touched. Yet here, too, there are problems. Much of northern Australia is still pristine wilderness of escarpment, woodland, and floodplain. Such scenic wealth readily converts into tourist dollars, making its natural beauty its economic salvation. It's a very different place from the rest of Australia. The north is governed by a tropical climate and annual monsoonal rains. But here too, man's influence is changing the face of Australia. Great swaths of wooded plains have been bulldozed. Their fragile topsoil has been laid bare to the onslaught of annual rains. Even if this does become productive cattle country, the cost will be prodigious in real dollars to the taxpayers subsidizing it and in the diminished character of the land. The wealth of uranium buried deep underground is another threat to the ancient landscape. Wealth needed, some argue, to keep Australia in economic health. But if misfortune should befall these mines, water polluted by heavy metals will flood into rivers and billabongs which underwrite all life in this part of the north. By comparison, Asian water buffaloes, which trample these wetlands into useless bogs, are a simple problem. Their numbers can be controlled. But if contaminated water should run through this priceless region, there is no remedy. The fragile ecology would not recover for thousands of years, if ever. Ironically, a changing attitude toward crocodiles reflects the maturing relationship between Australians and their land. It used to be simply one of exploitation. Saltwater crocodiles were once valued only for their skins, a quick way for returning soldiers to make money after the Second World War. They were hunted until few could be found. Then, amid growing concern about this vanishing heritage, crocodiles were given official protection in 1972. Now there are so many that a controlled harvest has been initiated. Australians have always displayed great ingenuity in responding to the challenges of living here and in coping with the disasters their actions produced. Rounding up buffaloes for slaughter is a practical solution to a straightforward problem. But in managing a place as fragile as Australia, they're confronted with many dilemmas 
organisms that need a more complex response. Especially valuable places like the Kakadu region in the north can be protected as national parks. Yet even here, argument continues about how much should be set aside and how much should be developed. Uranium is mined just outside the park, a commodity that competes with natural beauty in economic returns. What happens here may well set directions for the rest of the country. More than any other nation, Australia's identity is defined by the character of its wildlife. The welfare of its wild creatures reflects the health of the land itself, land that man too depends on for survival. In its wealth of extraordinary life, in the grandeur of its landscapes, Australia is a lucky country. Even after 200 years of European settlement, it still has a vast store of natural wonders and unique creatures that are the special nature of Australia. <laughs>